Welcome back to Inside City Hall, where we are now turning back to Albany, along with winning some key congressional seats. Republicans also made some inroads in the state Senate, where the GOP flipped several seats on Long Island. Democrats need two-thirds of the 63 seats in the chamber to retain a veto-proof supermajority, which gives them the power to override the governor. Meanwhile, Democrats also lost a number of seats in the Assembly, in addition to the House of Representatives, which has led to growing calls for state party chairman Jay Jacobs to resign. Here now to talk more about all of this is Michael Gianaris. He is the state Senate deputy majority leader. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me, Bobby. So let's start with the good news. The state Senate performed relatively well in Tuesday's election. You started out with 43 of the 63 seats in the chamber. There are still a couple of races that have not yet been called, right? So where do you guys expect to land once the dust is settled? Well, we're hopeful to maintain a supermajority status, which has, by the way, never happened in the history of the state until we did it in the last election. So just for some context, we're coming off the largest majority the state has ever seen. Majority the state has ever seen. Still a pretty good performance. There are 40 uh, races that have been called and uh, are in the Democratic column. There are two more that are going through their absentee counting process that should be wrapped up hopefully in the next uh, few days. Uh, and we're optimistic and hope to come back with 42, which would be an amazing feat. So you would need to win those two close races. One of them is here in the city. It's the new district in Brooklyn, a uh, plurality Asian district. And the Democrat in that race is slightly ahead uh, with some absentee ballots still to be counted. E. Wen Chu, you see there, with 50.3% of the vote, but uh, I think the difference there, only a couple of hundred votes. Yeah, it's very close, but one thing we saw universally across all the close races was that the absentee ballots cut in favor of our candidates, so the fact that she's ahead even going into that process bodes pretty well. We're confident that E. Wen will be joining us, and uh, as you pointed out, I think, in the intro, Southern Brooklyn was a tough... Uh, tough political terrain for Democrats this cycle, um, both in Congress and the Assembly. And if he went pulls it out, we will have won uh, all the seats that touch Southern Brooklyn for the state Senate. So again, uh, we're feeling pretty good about how we perform. If you do lose the supermajority, what does that mean exactly? Does that give you less leverage in trying to pass progressive legislation, say, uh, because you can't threaten to override Governor Hochul's veto? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, practically, it has very little consequence. We've had it for two years. We've never overridden a veto. Um, and it would come into play. Certainly, if Lee Zeldin was the governor, a supermajority would have been critically important to, to combat some of the uh, backwards policies that he would try to enact. But uh, with someone like Governor Hochul, who has been very collaborative with the legislature uh, and worked to uh, reach consensus, uh, I don't think it would have much practical consequence at all. I suppose there'll be some... Uh, leverage and discussions if we get to that 42nd number, but fundamentally we've been working pretty well uh, with her and her brief tenure and now look forward to the next four years with her. All right, let's talk about some of the bad news given the Democratic losses in the House. There's been a lot of finger pointing over the past week, finger pointing at Jay Jacobs, the Democratic chairman. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Also some finger pointing at you. You led the redistricting process back in February that resulted in maps that were very favorable to Democrats that were then thrown out by the courts for being illegally, unconstitutionally gerrymandered that then resulted in court-drawn maps, which resulted in the losses that we saw uh, on Tuesday. So the implication here was that uh, you and Albany Democrats got greedy and that it came back to bite you. Well, I love the criticism, uh, especially from those in our own party that, that take that approach. So their uh, advice would be do less, uh, try less to succeed, uh, appease our opponents, uh, and maybe you'll do better. Of course, that's nonsense. Now, what we just saw today, City and State published an article that did the analysis and ran the numbers, and it made it clear that the problem was with Democratic candidates' performance on Election Day, not with the district lines. If you overlaid all the various scenarios onto the results from Tuesday, the same result would have happened <laughs> because Democrats did poorly on Long Island. Those races would have been lost. Uh, in fact, what they found was the only scenario that would have given Democrats substantial gains in the House would have been the map that we passed that got uh, overturned by the courts. Now, the court went rogue. I believe it was a poor decision. It's their prerogative to make that decision, but uh, I vehemently disagree with it. I think it's in contravention with the state constitution, which some of the dissenters on that court uh, found. Their chief judge subsequently resigned under a cloud of suspicion, um, and she and the three judges that joined her have been facing a lot of criticism, not just for this, but for other decisions they made. Be that as it may, 
we faced a, a, a tough situation. The state Senate came through with flying colors. The assembly is going to have their supermajority. The House was, was a little tougher, um, and people need to ask why that happened. But I think no, no less of an authority than Dave Wasserman, who knows these things, just tweeted today that this was not a redistricting problem. These are all districts that Biden won. Uh, and so the performance of the candidates uh, for Congress seem to have been the main culprit here. Well, why did the, the candidates perform so poorly then? I mean, what should Democrats have done differently in this cycle? Well, I, I suspect there'll be an autopsy. My prerogative was the state Senate, and we won a lot of races in these places where the congressional candidates did not fare as well. Uh, but uh, whether they ran an adequate field campaign, whether the state party did enough, these are all things that are being sussed out uh, and peeled apart. But uh, as the time goes forward, uh, the problem and the analysis needs to be in terms of answering the question, why did the candidates perform so poorly in districts that Biden had won? Uh, and in, in a scenario where no matter what maps existed, but for the one that we actually passed and was overturned, the results would have been the same. Uh, and so. There's a lot of deflection and finger pointing going on from perhaps from those who are actually responsible, uh, but that's for them to answer. Well, how responsible is Jay Jacobs, the state Democratic chairman? There's now something like 1,100 signatures on a letter calling for him to be re removed as the state chairman. Is he uh, to blame for some of these losses? Well, look, I don't want to step on the governor's prerogative. Uh, the state chair and the state party is uh, now functioning under her leadership, and I want to give her the room to make an assessment and do what she thinks uh, is best. I did not sign that letter, but um, I have made very clear to her and her team very directly what my opinion is. I'm going to keep that council private for now, but hopefully um, we'll get this party unified and moving forward. Uh, suffice to say you're not a, a, a supporter of Jay Jacobs. <laughs> suffice to say. <laughs> okay. uh, let's talk about crime. I mean, fear of crime, the thinking goes, was really a winning issue for Republicans this time around. I mean, they seem to successfully tie Democrats to the rise in crime, largely because of the bail reforms that were passed in Albany uh, a few years back. I mean, what is the response to that on the part of Democrats? Is rolling back bail reform on the table? Well, we've already made two sets of amendments to that law, and uh, a number of us have looked at the data. The data is out there for all to see. The bail reform law has not caused the increase in crime. I'm not uh, diminishing the concern about crime and the fact that it's gone up. That is something we all grapple with and are concerned about every day. But bail reform has become a red herring for it. And, you know, you look back at the history of this thing. Uh, in 2018, there was a, a very public open letter to the legislature demanding that we enact bold bail reform immediately. Uh, and a number of very conservative business leaders had signed that calling for us to do so, uh, including Rupert Murdoch, whose newspaper now is the one that's beating the drum on this most of all. So there's plenty of room for uh, exposing uh, the hypocrisy about that attack and about that issue. That being said, if people are making good points, if the data justifies it, we're always looking to make things better. We, of course, are concerned with uh, improving public safety throughout New York, uh, and we will go where the facts take us, uh, and that's how we've always governed. In terms of the agenda moving forward, 2023, do you continue to push a progressive agenda, or is there some kind of course correction here to maybe move back towards the center? Well, because why? Because we got a, a potentially a supermajority in the state Senate that's only existed once before, and that's right now. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that uh, you could have any better uh, validation from the voters of the direction we've taken in the Senate than a year that was very tough for our colleagues uh, in Washington and some places in the Assembly, and yet we got validated with uh, a supermajority, potentially, or at least very close to it, once again. Um, so. I would look at this as a mandate to keep going in the direction we're going. I think that the voters are pleased with it. And by the way, we did all this with lines that were not drawn by us. Right? A Republican judge appointed someone to draw the state Senate lines in addition to the House lines. And we could be sitting there with 42, uh, at least 41, we believe, but hopefully 42 by the time all said and done. We'll, we'll keep an eye on those results. In the meantime, Mike Gianaris, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bobby.